Hi, Mel. How are you? Hi, Steph. I'm doing great. Thank you. I am how so are you happy. doing? I'm doing good. I'm doing good in this weird time of the year where it's hot and cold and hot and cold. A friend told me it's snowing where she is. So, you know, welcome to, welcome to Kentucky. <laughs> and I'm in Tennessee and it's just the same. <laughs> oh, no, I love it. I love it. But I love that we live in a world where we can hop on together and have chats together um, and talk, especially two PR professionals coming together because I like, I know you, Mel, like you wrote a book and I know you as an author, like deeply know you, but you're a PR practitioner. And so we really know each other. You told someone what, that we're like mirrors of each other. I love yes. that. Yes. That. <laughs> the first time I met you, I'm like, oh, I met, I met a mirror. I was talking in a mirror, oh, <laughs> but that's super exciting. It's it fun is. to meet other PR pros who understand you. <laughs> I know because we are very hard to understand sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then right before we started um, going live, there was uh, something you shared with me. And of course, I'm like, well, of course, we have to share this because that is that is totally in alignment with me, too. And so you had just shared. Well, you share it. Tell us about this word. I want well, hear. every year, Miriam Webster picks a word. And this year it's authentic. And I can't think of a better word for what we do because you sure want to be authentic when you're a public relations professional. And my book that we're going to be discussing here is all about the need to be authentic as a PR professional when you're on a major infrastructure project or any project for that matter. Well, authenticity is, is absolutely required in public relations because if not, people can see through it. Right. Like, you know, if you come to the table and you work to um, hear and learn and share about something you're going through, whether it's a crisis, whether it's a hardship or change, which is what we'll talk about with your book and like something that some people might not be on board with. If you come to it authentically and with a level of genuine authenticity, then people will listen because they know you care. And yeah. I think that is at the heart of your book and probably why so many great successes came from it. Yes. One of the most important roles that a public relations professional can play is being a trusted counselor. Yeah. And I love the way you said when you have that seated at the table, because that's so important. That was so important yeah. on this project that yes. I write about in the book, by the way, I should name it here. There it is. You have it on the screen, but it's called Fill the, the <laughs> damn thing up. <laughs> Yes. And while it is a book on the community relations outreach on a major $400 million infrastructure project, it was a damn project. Um, it has tips that are applicable to any communicator, any project manager. And as we're here on LinkedIn, I was thinking, well, everybody on LinkedIn is a business person and has to manage projects. So there's tips in this book that can help anyone uh, who needs to communicate their story authentically. Yeah. Well, so Parshel's, um, she's tuning in. She said she can't wait to hear all about it. And I'm Great. glad, I'm glad that we have people listening because this is not limited. What, what you write about in your book is not limited to only a, uh, an infrastructure project that you went through. You know, you have, I always say you kind of did like the litmus test, the gym mining in the, in the hills of, you know, <laughs> Kentucky and Tennessee. And you were like, where's the gyms in this? And what came from that is this beautiful playbook of how, individuals can look at a situation and make sure that all parties are kind of on in and on board and bought in in the journey. And so we can have win-win solutions, uh, even if it's something that makes people uncomfortable. So before we get too much deeper, though, Mel, like I, I do want us to tell people a little bit of this story. I think that context is really helpful. So tell us, when we talk about fill the damn thing up, I laugh because I'm like, <laughs> yay, but it's a literal dam, people. It's not just <laughs> any dam. It's a literal dam that you were a part of a seven-year project um, that was quite an undertaking. So tell us a little bit about that. Give us some context. Sure. I'm glad to. Well, first of all, the name has a fun context in that there was a local store right here in Johnson City, Tennessee, that sold apparel, uh, hats, t-shirts, and so forth that had that expression on it. <laughs> and the reason was we were on this major dam project and the way it came about was uh, it was always all about safety. That was always the top priority. And a dam safety inspector had uh, discovered first a sinkhole in a parking lot, immediately followed by some uh, a muddy seep, at, which indicated internal erosion in an earthen embankment right here in northeast Tennessee in an area. The dam itself is called Boone Dam. And in order to keep that dam safe and the people downstream safe, the lake above, the reservoir above had to be 
lowered fairly rapidly uh, in order to take that pressure off the earthen embankment. And then the work started from there in real time. Fantastic, phenomenal minds, not only here in the United States, but from all around the world came together to come up with the design and the fix, God. which was ultimately kind of a three-pronged fix. They put uh, berms along the sides of the earthen embankment. They did, had an intense drilling and grouting program. And then they ultimately made a an underground cutoff wall that literally cut off the seat. This was a concrete cutoff wall up to 170 feet down uh, the length of a couple of football fields, not a really large area to do the kind of work that took 200 people around the clock for a couple of years. And the whole project lasted seven years um, working on this. But ultimately, it did keep those people downstream safe. And that, of course, was my role as communicator. I had to always keep emphasizing, hey, this is about safety. But certainly, we understood that the people on the upstream side who happen to, generally speaking, be quite well off, have a lot of means, and have no problem getting on the phone to the governor, senator, or whoever <laughs> um, with a complaint. So we always tried to work with them very carefully. They, were, they actually ended up being friends because of just what I talk about in the book. The subtitle is Building Relationships and B Building Connections, which are building relationships. And so I would sit in those meetings of the Boone Lake Association, for example, every month. The first month, that they've got their arms crossed. They don't think I'm going to show up again. Well, guess what? <laughs> That's another trade of PR, right? persevere <laughs> be resilient come back keep Hi, showing up <laughs> yes. um but really build those relationships to the point where we ended up uh actually bringing volunteers from the projects on their saturday on the day off uh helping to clean up the lake during the annual cleanup uh the lake day every april um just all kinds of really formed long-term relationships and friendships out of it but it's a challenge at first as you can imagine oh my gosh well you know, you're dealing with your situation, something not everybody sees. So it's always a fun journey in public relations when you need to build consensus, camaraderie and buy in on something that is not always visible. Like, you know, like you said, the people upstream, their life was fine and dandy. There was nothing mm -hmm. happening. You know, here's somebody coming in and disrupting what is their comfortable. And yet mm -hmm. it is for the greater good. And so you know, it's, I think, harder to, to do strong PR work when it's something under the surface. Yours was literally under the surface, right? Under but the surface. It's interesting right. you mentioned that because that also made it a challenge. As a <laughs> PR person who was always out on the dam taking photos and videos and things like that, I could show the equipment. But the only way to show the actual wall would be like when they did the fabulous 3D visualizations and all the amazing things they were able to do from a technology standpoint. They drop cameras down the holes. They do cool things like that. But you didn't have a construction project that was coming up this way that we're used to seeing. You had one going down. <laughs> yeah. So it was yet another challenge with the project. Yeah, but you're doing it with a smile on. I'm sure that there were days that you probably were like, God, oh, this is insane <laughs> behind the scenes. But um, but I definitely believe that you've hit on this portion of relationship marketing and just relationships in general. When we look at, and I look at your project and everything you've told me about it, and I look at my past in PR and authorship and any small business, relationships are at the heart. And we live in a world where people don't think that that is as important, right? Like it's a digital world, right? So we could just shoot someone an email or we just need this and da, da, da. But relationships, relationship building will always prevail, right? Like the showing up, showing that you care with somebody, you know, what you did with the community groups when they would come together, showing up to, um, you know, how you're doing any project with anything at any scale, relationships win, in the long run. And yeah, tell me about that. Tell me about how well, you learned that. I was just thinking it, it totally ties back to that first word. And I'm so glad we launched this conversation with that because it comes back to being authentic. Yeah. And, and I think that relationships are even more important today, Stephanie, they because are. people are so used to the, maybe the jaded, callous, whatever kind yeah. of social media light <laughs> type yeah. relationships that we have, as opposed to really sitting and talking with one another and looking each other in the eye, like we're doing right here, yeah. right now, right? And and that's so important. And people want to be listened to. That was a big yeah. thing. That was a big part of the project. Listening to their concerns, uh, being able to, I mentioned that it was, we often worked at night for at least a couple of years. We would turn the lights so they didn't bother 
the person mm -hmm. whose home looked directly down the dam, who, who never thought they'd have to have window coverings on, right? They had this magnificent view and didn't realize suddenly things were going to change and they were going to be looking at a construction project for a while. We worked with that neighbor. We worked with another neighbor over sound concerns. We were able to erect a um, sound cushioning wall device. Well, how do you do that? You do it by listening. Yeah. And listening carefully and being willing to work together. Mm. When I went into PR, I thought that PR would be more talking, <laughs> and which Mel, I'm not, I'm not bad at. I've <laughs> asked anybody in my family and they're like, Stephanie hates silence and she'll fill it. Uh, but what I've really learned is most effective PR is listening. That the more that we listen and the more we really learn and we can hear what people are telling us, we can notice the trends, we can see the overarching elements that come together, um, and we can see how we can make a difference. I do think people want to be, be seen and feel seen and cared for and acknowledged. And when, when you're doing that in anything you're doing, but especially in a situation that could turn into a crisis that that is just one little moment away from finding that it's a more, more years than what people expected, or you uncover something else. I know you've shared with me through the project, you just kept uncovering things that needed to be identified um, when people feel like you really care about them. And authentically, I always say there's a difference between when they feel it and they know it. We don't want people to just feel like they're cared for. We want people to know that they're cared for. And right. I think that is at the heart of it all. And I think I have a good example. Um, I share some stories about some people that were perhaps, shall we say, a bit adversarial in the beginning, but they ended up becoming uh, friends throughout the course of the project. And one of the ways to do that was to actually give them a job, so to speak, in terms of a volunteer position. Because they were fantastic neighbors, they knew all the neighbors, they were able to help us with that direct neighbor outreach. There were so many stakeholders involved here, as you can imagine, from government officials, customers, mm -hmm. um, certainly the neighbors. Um, and so they would help us in that direct stakeholder outreach when we were uh, when we got involved in a vegetation management program, because that became important as the water came down, the vegetation came up. Yes. And so to actually be able to listen to their concerns and then be able to incorporate them into the solution was huge. And ultimately, and in the end, my greatest surprise that was that on our big day of celebration in May of 2022, when the project was finally over, um, uh, that very person came up to me and asked to do a selfie. And I was like, really? Oh, this is hilarious. This is great. We have made strides. <laughs> we have good. studies now. I love yes. that. Yes. Well, and, and I think that goes into this concept of getting buy-in, right? So yes. part of caring about somebody's opinion is also letting their opinions be heard and felt mm -hmm. and appreciated. But then I love how you mentioned giving them a job. Uh, mm -hmm. they, you didn't go to him and say, have a job for you, go do it. Instead, right. you helped that person see that there was a valuable role that they, that he could mm -hmm. play. And mm -hmm. with him playing a role in that, what was also happening is the buy-in of the project. So mm -hmm. then he wasn't going to go against things in the project the way, because he saw that he was a part of the end solution. Right, and right. I think that's important when you look at all of your stakeholders, both mm -hmm. the staff that were pulling it together, your contractors, mm -hmm. the teams, mm -hmm. the um, community members, residents, and everywhere in between. And you know, that was fascinating. That's a really fascinating story to share the international aspect of the project. So yeah. not only was I seated at that table we mentioned, but I was listening to all these different accents because it turns out there's a lot of expertise, not only here in the United States, but we're talking about several uh, European countries, folks from all around the world, really. And so I was listening to accented technical language. <laughs> And then I would basically translate that in my own head and then have to turn it into a newsletter or a tweet or whatever, because um, we had various methods of public outreach to uh, communicate with the public in just sort of basic English. Here's right. what's going on, because the public, of course, wanted to stay up to date. Communicating was, with the media was huge. We had a really I share it in the book. Uh, our most fun media update was the day we took them on a boat. <laughs> we took the media on the boat. We sure did. And that was fun. We had our senior construction manager driving the boat, our project manager narrating from the boat. And from our standpoint, it was great because the media was basically held captive. <laughs> 
<laughs> they couldn't just pop in no and pop out. No contract, people. You can't <laughs> leave. You're stuck. You know? Right. But honestly, to this day, I see some of the members of that media update and they say, that was the most fun update we ever had. But That's they got to see cool. from the water viewpoint then That's all the work we were doing, not only in terms of construction, but in terms of the vegetation management that we were doing as well. So that that's one of the things I share that maybe you need to think of some different ways if you're working in PR, some unique and innovative ways to update the media throughout the course of a project. Ooh, I like that. And, and I'll take it a step further as I think of authors or business owners or whomever out there that has a goal or a need, the creative ideas are what people remember. Like they mm -hmm. will remember the things that go against the grain. You know, this doesn't seem very creative, Mel, but since we're in the holiday season, I'm going to say it and as it relates to um, relationship marketing, like the handwritten thank you card goes a long um, way today, right? Nobody does that anymore. It is so funny you say that. I just received one. I sent a complimentary copy to a gentleman and his wife. He had worked on the project and she had taken the time to come and visit me. And I indirectly actually mentioned her in the book because I loved it when I would have visitors because it was in a very remote location. Yes. And um, so I sent them a copy. Well, they sent me, hand both of them wrote notes. I'm like, I'm going to treasure this. <laughs> See? that they thanked me like that is that. a lost art that should yes. not be lost it is you know so you don't when we get creative it doesn't have to be um you know finding a dam and taking people to it although that's a lot of fun you had right. one you could but many times in relationship building it's literally just about doing something that might seem small to you becomes really big to somebody else you know mm -hmm. um, and i think that the art of a card goes a very long way um, you know, Mel, you could have gone through those seven years and go, man, this was a win. We made it through. This was lovely and not told anybody about it, but you chose mm -hmm. to write a book about it. Uh, why? I'm really like, I want to know what, what's your why behind it all? Well, I feel there is a need for infrastructure PR in this country because we have so many infrastructure projects going on. And as I began to write, and I chronicle this in the book, I sat down to write and all of a sudden this terrible situation happened in Pittsburgh where a bus ended up dangling off a bridge. A br bridge was collapsing. Thank goodness no one was killed in that incident. But um, how crazy is that? And I'm like, oh my goodness, maybe this was a sign that I'm supposed to write about infrastructure PR, because we have such a need in, in our country right now. So I hope it's helpful to others. Like I said, it could be a project manager, could be a communicator, could be some other stakeholder on a project who just needs to see how a major, and this was an international award-winning project, by the way, and every single international award we would apply for, there was always a community relations component. It was a very important component of the project. Mm -hmm. So I figured there's folks out there that would like to see how it was handled. And the number one thing was it was it was finished safely, on time, and under budget. How about that? Okay, win. That's the triple win. <laughs> that was correct, a triple win. Triple win. Uh, mm -hmm. I think the other part that is beautiful about your book and other books in, that would you know chronicle a beautiful case study like this is um, the best way to, to to you know be prepared for a crisis is to be prepared for a crisis. So if you're thinking mm -hmm. through some of these things ahead of time, then when a crisis occurs it's not at the same level of crises, right? Like when something happens, you're prepared for it and you go, okay, well, I know, I know who my stakeholders are. I know what I need to do. I've already created relationships with the media. So I surely to goodness hope they will trust me if something happens and they won't, you know, snowball and spin it. Maybe they'll come to the source or when the community gets all frustrated, maybe they're not at the same level of frustration because you can get ahead of the conversation. Uh, and mm -hmm. I think that's where a beautiful case study, uh, when someone Someone opens up the the doors and say, let me tell you, let me show you it all. Let me talk you through mm -hmm. it all. Does right. for people. Right. And they'll see too, when they read the book, it's, it's not all, what did we say? Unicorns and roses. <laughs> I mean, there's some yes. real challenges. It's my authentic story. Yeah. Um, I heard your guest, Jennifer, um, on one of your previous ones talking about how important it is for the author to write to a person and to be genuine. And I'm like, Oh yes, I'm me, I yes. am that. Um, yeah. Because, uh, it's, it's, it's my story. You know what I mean? It's, it's the actual personal level, the, the loneliness, the stress, um, the things that happened that I was in a trailer with two armed guards. Why is that? Because someone had threatened to blow up the dam prior to my arrival. You know, there are crazy people in the world, right? Unfortunately, but you do everything you can to try to mitigate that. And then how do you mitigate that? And, um, and luckily the vast majority were, were really good folks to work with. So uh, I love but that it, you take off the filter, right? Like, so 
we live in a filtered society where it's easy to put on an Instagram filter and look at, look at what's going on and look at everything that's great. But people mm -hmm. connect with the honest, raw, vulnerable parts because we all experience that. So with you mm -hmm. sharing like even the isolation of uh, physical mm -hmm. isolation, but I know mm -hmm. the emotional isolation that it feels sometimes in PR too, right? Like that. Right it automatically connects somebody go, Oh my gosh, I get it. Or when I talk to different business owners, uh, I had one the other day, she goes, Oh my gosh. So I don't have anybody to ask this, but how uh -huh. do you do doom, 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 doom. And I'm like, Oh, I'm so glad you asked. Cause I'll tell you how I do it, but how do you do it? Right. So uh -huh. start to open up and talk about the hardships, the things that don't always go perfect. Everybody grows, everybody wins. You know, it's so funny you mentioned that. Like I didn't even, you had a PR pro that had worked at like law firms and corporate America. And all of a sudden I get thrown on a construction project. 99.9% .9 male, right? Right off the bat. I have no idea how to dress. A, a, I, I have a whole chapter on that. Um, the guys gave me a pink art at it because they knew I loved pink. It was really fun. In the end, it all ended up great. I had pink work boots and pink oh, art. At. Um, but I had to learn, you know, the khakis and the whole, the whole uh, specific attire, the long sleeve work shirt and all those kind of things that you just have to sort of pick up, especially when you're out there alone and, and um, finding your way. But there's um, many things like that where yeah. you, uh, just like you said, you you figure you figure it out, and then I in turn hope to share it with others. So perhaps they won't have those same stumbling blocks. There's been a way. phrase that follows me, Mel. I may have told mm -hmm. this to you. I'm sure you you listen to the podcast, so I'm sure you've heard me say it. But you don't know until you know, and when you know, you can't unknow. And so what I've uh -huh. learned in life is I didn't know I needed something, and then I learned that I need it, and I'm like, oh my gosh, well. I now know that I need it. And I think to add on, you don't know until you know, when you know you can't unknow, then I should add something like, so you need to let other people know, right? So yes. as a group, just keep telling and sharing. This is where like we evolve as people, where we grow collectively. There's enough mm -hmm. space for everybody. And so when we can mm -hmm. learn from our own mistakes or not even mistake, just learning, right? Like I think right. it's everybody can win and you know, right. that more people can get pink hats, hard hats. <laughs> <laughs> some other, some other fun stories were just the cultural differences. I mentioned there were people from all over the world and there were also people uh, that many of the construction workers were from right here in Appalachia. And so the first thing I learned that was probably again, 99% chew tobacco. And I, that was not even something I had ever been familiar with. So, okay. So I got used to that. Um, a, a, another was um, just some of the fun nuances of the different nationalities, like the French love to walk everywhere. Learned that very quickly. You know, they have a promenade, right? And so one of the French project managers, I remember uh, he built a special pathway all around the project so that he could look and really? uh, I, yeah, yeah. So he could have a great views as he walked around. And I ended up learning to tag along with him and his team uh, to get pictures from their viewpoints. Awesome. And that was very helpful. Uh, oh, the guys, some of the guys were bear hunters. This is what I'm talking about. It was just all across the map, the fascinating people that were there. So we would have these chili cook-offs and they would bring their bear and their venison, right? <laughs> it wasn't just your normal go down to Kroger's and get beef, right? <laughs> Oh my gosh, what's so. how cool is that? Because I'm a believer we become better people when we take the time to get to understand other people that aren't like us, that don't think like us or live like us or physically in different locations than us. So how fun that you kind of had it all at once during that time. And I know it opens your eyes. Bear hunters. That, that's a really special chapter me, to me as I think back on it, because I also cover the diverse STEM camp. We, we sponsored a number of STEM camps, but one in particular was aimed at diverse high school students that might not ever have an opportunity to work in STEM or be exposed to STEM. And oh my goodness, it was fantastic to see these kids out in a stream with wildlife biologists, looking at fish, holding fish, um, see them having opportunities that, well, it, it, it's just really, really special. And who knows, maybe we were uh, planting the seeds for future engineers or wildlife biologists or all it's kinds this, of things. That's right? what impact is, Mel. We don't know. Mm -hmm. uh, the type of impact, you know, that I like is not like car wreck impact or breaking a glass because a football threw it, threw, was thrown through it impact. It's the ripple impact. It's the, we right. do something. And I think as authors, right. this is what we do, right? We write a book because we know somebody needs it, but we, right. we don't get the glory of seeing the face most times of the people who get it. And then right. how their lives are changed by it. And so just like what you said, you don't have a clue. We'll never be able to fully 
quantify, qualify, hug the whole <laughs> groups of people who are positively impacted by what you did as a part of that project and what you've done in writing this book. But we do it because we know that we can make a difference and it's a big deal. It is. It's a bit, bigger deal than I would have thought if anybody out there is thinking about writing a book. Mm -hmm. I've been astonished actually at how many doors a book opens. Mm -hmm. it, it really, does. it just it starts to open, lot. open opportunities for you. And not only in public speaking, um, but I know you always like to say people think authors are cool and I didn't really realize it until it happens. But, you know, you sit down, I sat down at my national PR conference in Nashville recently, the PRSA icon. And I was like, yeah, I'm a PR consultant. And everybody's like, oh. and then I say, and I just launched a book. Oh, really? Oh, tell us about that. Well, you're, <laughs> you're not like, just the person that talks about it. You're the person that wrote the book about it. Exactly. Exactly. And they really want to hear all about it. Books are powerful. And I, I, you just told my secret when I tell everybody we're not that, I mean, we're special, but we're like, not that like, we're no special, more special than somebody else. Right. But what we've done is we did what so many people want to do. And very yes. few people do. We, there was a work ethic that came to, to accomplish what we've done. We sat down and we closed the doors and we went into hiding sometimes, or we, you know, chose a different um, way to use our time so that we could capture something that we hope will change the lives of other people. Uh, and it does, it, it does open doors. And I know your book's doing that too. So tell us, because your book is like, oh, I sound like hotcakes, friend. Tell us, <laughs> This holiday, you've got some really cool things going on. Tell us a little bit about what those are. Well, they can find it on Amazon in the print edition. The yeah. e-edition is also out. And I've narrated the audiobook that hopefully, fingers crossed, we're just waiting for the okay from Audible, but hopefully awesome. that'll be out soon as well. So then people will have it in every format that they wish to choose from. Um, people can connect with me on marketingmel.com. I see that rolling across the screen. Thank you very much. And they can find out all kinds of details there. And I also have a holiday book bundle going where you can buy, instead of paying the 1637 or whatever it is on Amazon, I'm selling direct to folks, particularly locally in the example I'm going to give, but I can also figure out a way to ship if someone's interested in shipping. Um, but um, I do a $12 book deal for a quantity of 25. And I've had several folks that I work with, like, for example, my finance person, insurance person, the president of the Boone Lake Association, um, another financial person, they're all doing this. They're taking advantage because they want to give that as a holiday gift to their clients and friends. So I'm super excited about that. And that's a neat opportunity. It is a really cool opportunity. So if you're listening today and you're like, okay, I, I have a group of people that could really benefit from the proactiveness of knowing what and how we could prepare for PR situations that could come up, or I'm interested in this project, or I want to do, there's so many ways, contact Mel. She would be mm -hmm. uh, for more than happy to make sure that you can get some of those for the holidays. Mel, Absolutely. What, that? What, what else? Is there anything that we didn't talk about today? I feel like we had some really great discussions today. And every time we talk, there's more ideas that come to my mind of like all the vast knowledge you bring to this world, friend. Well, I'm glancing down at my notes here and I guess a couple other really important things to em emphasize. We talked about the importance of perseverance and then really in public relations, I, I do want to emphasize the code of ethics because that's so important in what we do. You yeah. want to be ethical in whatever you're doing, mm. you know, have yeah. integrity, be honest with those folks. If you don't know the answer, say, I'm going to go find out the answer. I can't, I can't just make something up, you know? Yes. And so that's, that's huge in public relations for a professional. I have my accreditation and we actually um, study the code of ethics as part of the APR, as it's called accreditation in public relations. So I think that would be the other uh, important thing. And I followed that code of ethics throughout the seven years of the project. Well, I think it's, I think it merges back with um, where we started on the word authentic. When mm -hmm. you are ethical and you focus on, even though you the company you're working for, the, uh, the book you wrote, the business that you've created, the, the, the dam that needs filling, they have their own goals and needs. But as PR professionals and um, really as human beings, when we can come to the table with that level of ethics, there is a win-win win, the triple win that can happen where you don't have to know all the answers. You don't have to, um, you know, spend something. You can be honest. You can be real and truthful. And when relationships matter, um, then at the end of the day, people will feel that. And so I love that you bring that up because we live in a world where it's really easy to be unethical. 
when it comes to marketing and public relations. But when you lead with your ethics, people can feel it. And that's where people, where that's where authenticity comes in. Yes, it really, we've gone full circle, haven't we? <laughs> I know, we didn't even plan for that to happen. That was awesome. It was awesome. Well, Mel, I'm so glad that you pressed pause today and hop on uh, this live stream with me. I'm also glad that you did the hard thing. Not only did you fill the damn thing up, but you wrote the damn book about filling the damn thing up. And you showed up here today. You're showing up regularly. You are doing things so that people have a different experience in their own worlds when it comes to PR efforts. So thank you for all of that and on behalf of your readers. Um, and I'm just excited to see where this book is going to take you, friend. Big thanks. Thank you. Thank you for all your help, Stephanie. You are so 